I am, uh, I, I'm excited to have you all here. Thank you for coming. This is uh, very important, uh, very important for us, very important for CSIS, very important for WISE. And I want to welcome all of you for, uh, and thank you for coming tonight. I especially want to thank uh, Nina Easton for being with us tonight to moderate a discussion with these two remarkable women who joined us from the administration. It was a little touch and go whether we were going to be able to get them tonight. And that's because they're both central figures uh, in, the, in the policy pulse of this administration. And so you know, as in Washington, you know, that can change you know, quite abruptly. And, uh, <laughs> but we were very fortunate that they were both able to come. We did uh, lose Wendy Sherman. Uh, but that we understood, and it, it, this was, uh, you, like I say, when you, when you shoot for three of the biggest names in the government, we knew we were going to not get everybody. But we do want to say special thanks uh, to our colleagues for joining us. I, you know, my r role here is strictly to, uh, to introduce Jolyn uh, Shoemaker, but I, I, I can't resist. You know, I'm going to say just a few words if, if you'll indulge me. Um, you know, we're just, we've just hooked up with WISE. Uh, WISE is a 25-year-old organization, started off at the University of Maryland. Uh, and back when they were starting, this was a time when to be a woman in international security was a real challenge. There were not many women in the business. Matter of fact, I look out in the audience, I see some of the pioneers that were involved in this, but it was lonesome. There are a lot of the people here tonight that weren't even born when this was <laughs> starting off, which is good, because uh, uh, I'd hate to have you have to endure the kind of uh, restraints we put on ourselves back then. Why we thought it was better to deny ourselves 50% of the gene pool to run this country, I'll never figure out, but that's kind of where it was back then. And so when WISE was first starting, um, you know, it was genuinely needed uh, to provide mentoring and networking opportunities for women. It was a lonesome field and challenging, and frankly, there was a lot of, there were strong headwinds, you know, to many women that were entering this field. So it was very important. Now the question is, what, what is WISE doing now? What do we need it for now? And I can only give you my personal view. I mean, obviously, it's going to be up to you to, to decide this. And, and I've had many conversations with Joe Lynn about this. But I can only tell you my own, some of my own personal views. I mean, we have an obsolete uh, civilian personnel management system for this government. You know, it's kind of a World War II blue collar label, grind your way up from the bottom, start as a GS7, spend your 30 years to work up the system. That's our system. Well, think about what that means for trying to hire talented women in this era. Women that have so many more opportunities in the private sector than they did 30 years ago. And to say, oh no, you can't leave if you want to proceed. You've got to stay in this job grinding away without any change for 30 years. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a different, there's a different calculus that enters the lives for women. Michelle will tell you about this. She's several times, we've been the beneficiary because she came to CSIS for her family at one point in time. You know, we're, but yet our government personnel rules really don't accommodate that. You know, they, unless you come back as a political appointee, and that's a fairly thin veneer. You know, we're still, we're cheating ourselves because we have obsolete personnel rules. And I would also say, Part of, and this is, I'll probably offend some people when I say this, but we are on the wrong track in this country on public government ethics. Because we, in essence, we're saying, if you have had relevant experience, you're suspect, right? If you know something, we probably don't want you in the government. You know, that's, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Well, so if, if you want to have a career path for women, and women do need to be able to get in and out of the field because they've got family obligations, and sometimes that goes into the private sector. Are we, aren't our ethics rules starting to get in the way? I tell you they are. I mean, these are things we have to start thinking through. We've got a lot of work to do. So there's a big agenda in my mind for WISE, and it's part of the reason that we wanted to host them here. I mean, this is an opportunity for us. We hope it's an opportunity for WISE, and we're gonna need everyone here. We're gonna need all of your help. Because there's a lot more, and honestly, more structural and deeper, harder work in front of us. 
So and that's why I want to say special thanks to these very talented women that would kind of launch us off. This is our first real mm -hmm. experience. We've had a couple of private things, but this is our first big public thing. And it couldn't be a better way to do it. And Jolyn, let me turn to you. Why don't you get this started for, for real? Thank you. Everybody, thanks for coming. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamry. Um, I think uh, it's just such an honor to be affiliated with CSIS. And of course, we have uh, strong linkages historically with CSIS, with Michelle and many other um, women who have been a key part of WISE over the years, also being key parts of CSIS. Um, it's also the beginning of our 25th anniversary, so uh, it's a perfect time to have this kickoff event um, for our new chapter for WISE as I see it. Um, I just wanted to say briefly that 2011, and I think so many of you in the audience know this, was a big transition year for WISE. And uh, so many people were really critical to that process. Um, there are so many of you in the audience who really offered so much insight, advice, and support during the process. And um, I wish I could thank all of you from up here, but it would take up all of our time, so I won't do that. But I just do want to um, send a special thanks to my colleague, Marie Lore. Where did you go, Marie Lore? OK. <laughs> um, who's like the right hand of this operation. And, um, and I couldn't do anything I do for WISE without her help. We're, we're a team effort. So uh, thank you very much for all you do. I'm just very pleased to see so many people who have such a long history with WISE in the audience as former board members, advisory council members, as supporters, and as friends and members, um, so instrumental to the organization's growth. And of course, I want to second Dr. Hamry's point about uh, thanking both Michelle and Samantha for being here tonight um, with their very busy, both professional and personal lives. Um, I'm also very thankful to those of you who are new to WISE here tonight, and we really look forward to involving you in our programs moving forward. I just want to say a couple things about the WISE mission. Um, our mission is to promote women's leadership opportunities in peace and security uh, at all levels of their careers. Uh, a couple important things about WISE. We are global, we are inclusive, and we are unique because our community brings together many sectors. We bring together many expertise areas, many geographic areas, and many perspectives. And I think that makes us an incredibly special uh, organization. Um, we have about 7,000 people in our network. Um, they're individuals and their organizations and institutions who share with us the mission um, and, and work towards the cause of women's full participation in peace and security. We provide a platform for elevating the perspectives, experiences, and voices of women, and most importantly, for supporting the next generation of female leadership that is so crucial to peace and security. We've played an incredible role in supporting the rise of women in this field over the years, and we really do celebrate, celebrate these incredible accomplishments that I think are truly embodied by the women here on this stage tonight. But we must acknowledge there is much work to be done. Uh, the challenges we face globally cannot be tackled without the full participation of this talent pool. Unfortunately, we're losing women's contributions at many stages along the way, either through le leaky pipelines or decision-making processes and cultures that continue to exclude or sideline the voices of women. Therefore, we must all work, those of us here today who care about this issue, collectively and diligently to close these gaps. It is my hope that you'll leave this event with a renewed dedication to this goal and assisting us in our mission. And I welcome all of your involvement and your expertise in all of our programs. Um, I just wanted to make a quick housekeeping note. You each have cards on your seats, and we really welcome you to write down questions for uh, the speakers tonight. Uh, what we're going to do for efficiency's sake is collect those uh, mid-program, and then we'll try to choose some of those that we can, um, we can ask uh, with time permitting. 
Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome Nina Easton. Uh, Nina, as many of you know, is an accomplished and well-known journalist. She is Fortune's uh, Washington columnist and senior editor and uh, serves as a panelist and commentator on many news shows as well. Had previously worked um, for the Los Angeles Times and the Boston Globe and is of course an author of an acclaimed political history as well. And we thank you very much, Nina, um, at first for taking the time out of your schedule as well and flying down from Boston to join us for this event. I'm going to turn it over to Nina, who has graciously also offered to uh, introduce our speakers and to facilitate our discussion tonight. Thank you all once again, and I look forward to the next Era for Wise at CSIS. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Jill, and um, obviously our speakers really don't need any introduction, particularly with this crowd. We are so honored to have both of you. Samantha Power, as you all probably well know, is a, uh, start as a, a journalist whose coverage of the Balkans conflict led to a Pulitzer Prize winning book criticizing uh, policymakers for not getting involved enough in trying to stop genocide. And that's become, I think, a lifelong passion of, um, towards human rights. She's the founding executive director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School where I have an office right now as in a fellowship. Jealous. <laughs> um, and she's currently special assistant to President Obama for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights. Her title is much longer, but um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, and obviously, as we'll go into it, quite critical uh, in, in central to much of the policy making of this administration. Michelle Flournoy often has been touted as the, I hope she doesn't cringe too much, the likely next female Secretary of Defense. <laughs> Um, and uh, she s serves as the uh, Pentagon's really the chief policymaker, the highest ranking woman, and helped shape the, administ the administration's Afghanistan strategy. She served in a range of top defense positions uh, under the Clinton, uh, Clinton administration. And in 2007, co founded the Center of a New American Stra Security. Center for, a, I'm sorry, I wrote that wrong. Center for a New American Security, which was a think tank credited, this is interesting, with um, really breaking new ground on counterinsurgency uh, strategy, which I found quite interesting. Our conversation is going to range, we're going to talk about women in, um, in policy, but I also kind of want to show off these women and, and the policies that they're involved in right now and their leadership right now. Um, I want to start with Samantha. Um, you were part of something that came out in December, little notice, the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. I had the honor of interviewing um, Secretary Clinton at the APEC Summit, um, and gave us, she gave us a, a, a brief overview of it, but it came out in detail without a lot of notice. Could you give us a, a good overview of that? I can try. <laughs> uh, I think Michelle also, uh, who is a huge champion of these issues, um, could, could speak to it. But um, basically what we have are a number of um, uh, almost axioms about the way uh, societies progress and don't progress. And one of the axioms, of course, is if women are left out of economic development, societies are more likely to stagnate. If women are left out of peace processes, those peace processes, it turns out, correlatively, are much less likely to succeed. And it turns out women who are part of those peace processes bring attention to the kind of sustainable issues, not merely ending conflict, but the kinds of uh, reconciliation, you know, health, uh, welfare, sort of uh, DDR, demobilization of soldiers. You know, they just have attention, uh, bringing attention to the long game. Um, uh, women, um, of course, are often early warners of conflict to come. They're often, they see their sons, their husbands, et cetera, going off or, uh, could be alarm bells uh, in conflict prevention situations. So all these things we know, or we think we know, we need more empirical work, and, and CSIS is a big part of the, the solution, as is a new center at Georgetown that was just set up uh, in conjunction with the release of the National Action Plan. Um, but we in the government, and certainly our leadership, uh, have made it very clear that we should have policies that act upon these axioms. In other words, if we know women should be involved in peace processes, let's get them involved in peace processes. If we know that political transitions are more likely to endure if women are in the parliament or in the, the, the governing ministries, then our diplomacy toward Libya should reflect that. So we know all this, but prior to uh, the president 
uh, uh, taking on this task and instructing the cabinet agencies and Secretary Clinton and Secretary Panetta and, and others and uh, USAID Administrator Raj Shah really embracing the bureaucratic implications of those axioms um, you know, is in a way it's left to chance. And so what the National Action Plan does and the executive order that accompanied it from the president is it has all of the agencies uh, involved in foreign policy stepping up and saying, here's how we're going to change our training. Here's how we're going to change our diplomacy. Here are, uh, here's how our, we're going to inject a regard for sexual and gender-based violence into the mandates that we put before the UN Security Council. And so what you'll see, and I brought a little prop here, the National Action Plan. <laughs> uh, the National Action Plan, uh, available on a website near you, uh, has a series of very, very concrete uh, commitments. And I, I would note, that, and this is again something Michelle can speak to far better than I can, but DOD is one of the best examples of how when you can get a set of presidential priorities, a set of strategic priorities into the DNA of the building, all kinds of things happen. It gets in, integrated into doctrine, into training. You know, you, you will end up seeing, you know, in planning guidance in some, you know, uh, theater of operations that we may not have had on our minds when we were developing this plan together, uh, suddenly it turned up that, well, we've got to have a gender advisor to the combatant commander, or we've got to make mm -hmm. sure our soldiers out there as they train foreign militaries bringing women and encouraging those foreign militaries to have units that comprise women as well as men, et cetera. So that's what the executive order does. It, it, it's a statement of US policy. It's a statement of prioritization. And it's an effort to institutionalize the insights that you know, many of the people here have been preaching for a long time, but to get them into the fabric of the way we do our business in the US government. And it raises the question, though, of how, particularly with cultural bias. And let's talk about Afghanistan. I mean, how, do you, how, do, how could you see this moving forward in Afghanistan as, as one of the chief architects of the it, strategy there? It, it actually has already had an impact on the ground. Um, for example, you know, one of the challenges in a society like Afghanistan is the separation of the genders. Um, and that particularly if you have a predominantly male uh, unit of soldiers, they're only interacting with the male half of the population. And the, the female side of the population is really sort of off limits in an Afghan culture to most of our soldiers. So one of the things that this work inspired was the creation of female engagement teams, where we actually train uh, uh, small teams of women to go in with a combat unit, you know, female soldiers or Marines, and actually seek out the, 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 the women in the village and talk with them. It's amazing what you These learn. These are female Americans. The female American it's soldiers and Marines okay. who go in and now focused on interacting with the women. It's amazing. <laughs> what you can learn um, culturally from an intelligence perspective, just a whole different set, uh, perspective on what the needs of that, that area mm -hmm. are, what's happening in that area, um, and the stresses and strains on the population and so forth. So it's been a, a really invaluable tool. At the same time, as we try to build capacity in the Afghan government, um, we've encouraged, uh, for example, the development of female police officers, the development of female um, army officers and so forth. Again, somewhat foreign concept for, for um, uh, the Afghan security forces, but one that they too have seen the benefits of embracing this and being able to have members of their own security forces who can interact effectively with their, their female population. Another example of this is just sensitizing our folks on the ground to the need to bring women into community processes. I mean. You know, traditionally, Lloyd Jurgas, Shoras, these, these community gatherings where issues are worked through, in, in traditional Afghan society, those usually don't include women. One of the things that started to happen is that the recent Lloyd Jurga, for example, did include, included female parliamentarians, it included female activists, and so forth. And so, um, and it, at first, it's a, it's a sort of uncomfortable, awkward, situation in a culture that's not used to that. But I think at the end of the three days of the last jirga, um, without question, it was, I think, universally accepted as a really positive development and that the, the participation of women brought a lot to the table. So um, what kind of numbers are you seeing on police officers and uh, military it's still small it's numbers, it's, it's but good. it's a start. Um, and and is there, was there resistance or must have been? 
Well, so. it, it ranges. There, there, you know, the institutional resistance, I think, has diminished substantially. The real resistance is really, it's a foreign notion for the, um, the society. I, I make a point whenever I go to Afghanistan to seek out um, one of these units. And the last, uh, I visited the police training center in Kabul this last time and met with all of the women recruits. And some story, you know, the stories varied from one woman who felt that had the full support of her pa family as this is the most patriotic thing she could be doing for a new Afghanistan to another woman who was completely disowned by her family because she was choosing to join the police yeah. force as this is mm -hmm. something that was so outside their realm of experience that they just they couldn't right. accept it. Can you talk more broadly about Afghanistan and how you see, I know this is a broad question, but how do you see things playing out there and, and the role of the Taliban in particular? Yeah. I think we're at a really critical juncture. The, the, uh, the strategy review that President Obama undertook and then the really the recommitment of effort and focus and resources both on the civilian and military side have enabled us to really make a lot of progress on the security side and shift the momentum. For the first time in five years, um, the level of violence in Afghanistan is down. Um, the momentum has shifted away from the Taliban. They have not been able to regain key areas in the south and their sort of heartland, if you will. But it's, so it's created some security space. We've, we've begun a transition process with handing over different areas to uh, Af the Afghans for security lead. But the real critical juncture we're at now is that we've created space for something else to happen. And that something else really needs to be a political settlement um, within Afghan society. That, and that's where this Afghan-led discussions with the Taliban, with other stakeholders in society is going to be so criti critical to actually consolidating the security gains and, and charting a course for uh, stability in the future. So you see the, the Taliban as being part of negotiations and moving forward and well, talking with them and incorporating them into the process. They're not, y yes, they're not a monolithic group. There are going to be some who choose to come and be part of the process and be reintegrated into society, and there'll be some who choose not to and will be dealt with you know, through you know, continued uh, military pressure. But I think that that process is going to be central to the outcome in Afghanistan. Samantha, I wanted to turn to you about the Arab Spring. I mean, you were at the center of, um, at least according to news reports, uh, the, the president's decision to intervene in Libya uh, for humanitarian reasons, which was controversial. People, there were those who didn't want us intervening at all. There were those who thought that was a bad reason to intervene, a bad, bad precedent. Um, but you've, you've got Libya um, and you've got Egypt, uh, num among a number of countries there. Uh, Egypt in particular, uh, women who were at the forefront of the revolution are now, um, as, as Hillary Clinton put it, um, uh, they, they, they've been you know, out in the streets where they were protesting. They've now been humiliated and beaten and repressed and not, not to mention just completely shed out of the decision-making process there. What's your overall prognosis for women in the Arab Spring? And again, broad question, but what, what's your thinking on that? And, and what role can the U.S. really play? Um, well, first, just to take the opportunity, because I don't get out much, to correct the press reports. Uh, <laughs> turns out we have this amazing president, President Obama, who made these uh, uh, pretty amazing, and in the case of Libya, extremely brave uh, decisions um, uh, that resulted in, in, in saving so many lives. And, and uh, just, it was a sight to behold, really, to see somebody step up. You know, one of the things I documented in a problem from hell over many years, looking at many cases from time immemorial, really, um, was just that by the time we realized that the, the benefits of acting outweighed the costs, because there are always costs and there are always genuine risks, and by acting, you know, the range of things you can do in different circumstances. Um, but by the time we had that realization, it was too late. And uh, I think President Obama, you know, this spring, um, r whether it was with regard to Egypt and the leadership and, you know, drawing on the relationship that had been built over, over many generations with the Egyptian government, but also over several years with President Mubarak to try to get ahead of events there, or with regard to Libya, um, with Benghazi hanging in the balance and so much at stake uh, for him to lead the world in the way that he did and, and move beyond a no-fly zone to something that would really protect civilians on the ground. 
Um, I mean, it really was uh, remarkable. And, he, and it, like you say, it was, it's not necessarily politically rewarding to do that. Um, but I had the opportunity to travel with Ambassador Rice to Libya um, not long ago. And just, I mean, to see the level of um, if just the effusive uh, regard for this president, this country, the American people, you know, and, and the sense that America's on Libya's side, you know, through what will be a very, very difficult road ahead. Um, we have a great head start, you know, because, and I point again to, to Michelle and, and the Defense Department's remarkable leadership in this very, very complex operation. Um, but the dividend, you know, now lies ahead, and of course the overall uh, success of the, the, um, the policy that was made in the spring will be, be judged over time, you know, both in, t in terms of the answer to the question you posed about women, but more broadly uh, about the durability of this uh, democratic transition. Uh, in terms of women, I mean, we, I met again when I was there with, in, in Libya with a, a group of women leaders and, and you definitely already had the sense of nervousness that things were slipping away, that look, we, there we were in Benghazi Square, you know, we were out there risking our lives. Um, you know, women were supporting men in Tripoli as they, as they rose up and, and very much a part of that kind of remarkable operation and, and coordinated operation that ended up bringing about the, the fall of Tripoli. Um, and they're saying, you know, what, wh wh where is our place? By virtue of their advocacy, you know, they secured two uh, ministries. I think they had hoped for more in this kind of transitional cabinet. Uh, they were very focused on the election law. Uh, and uh, I think right now we have word that the election law allots 10% of the seats uh, in the parliament for women. And, but there's some debate, and we, I think we, I just came from a meeting on this today, about whether the 10% is a floor or a ceiling. And of course, our <laughs> position is <laughs> instructive ambiguity that it's a floor. <laughs> And only the beginning, uh, you know, of the of the dialogue, but it's not it's our a, position. A peek that, into the challenges you face. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, the so so it'll be women advocates who, in the same way that they lobbied for, you know, uh, some, again, pre-dedicated, pre-designated allotment, will now argue for a more maximal interpretation of the law. And and there's a lot of interaction. I mean, you can already see the fruits of a society uh, or, or of a transition in a society that not long ago, I mean, really not long ago you got the death penalty for setting up an NGO. I mean, that was how repressive it was. So the fact that people have activated in this way doesn't guarantee uh, outcomes, you know, that are uh, consistent with the values that we're, we're here to talk about tonight, but um, it's a precondition for that. And, and uh, I think you see the leadership of the TNC and the transitional authorities really feeling like they have to cater to this community. It doesn't mean they're catering sufficiently or, um, uh, in the way that, that satisfies the demands of the women, but there's a definite sense that there's a constituency out there. And so that's already a kind of democratic um, ethos uh, taking hold, that sense that you have to be responsive, that you're accountable uh, in some fashion. With regard to Egypt, I, I can't say it better than Secretary Clinton, who, who um, I think just gave such a, a, you know, a poignant, uh, sort of issued a, a poignant appeal uh, for the better angels to emerge there and for these issues to be taken, to be elevated and to be taken uh, very, very seriously. Um, but I would say, again, if you look at women's participation in the recent elections, participation as a whole was, was kind of jaw-dropping. Um, you know, relative to, to, to the logistic challenges that, that, that uh, uh, you know, a society that hadn't done a, 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 base, a free or fair election before, you know, I think that the, the, there were a modest number of irregularities. Obviously, we're very concerned about the treatment of women in the streets. But again, just as the Libya example uh, underscores, I think, you know, as devastating as the treatment of women has been in some regards, the counter movement, the counter protest, the fact that those women came out and took to the streets mm -hmm and protested in that fashion, um, again, making their voices heard, you know, saying it wasn't just a change in the titular leadership of the society that we're talking about, we're talking about a change in business as usual. And so it's, you know, of course it's gonna take time, but I think it's, it's the fact, where we would have to start to be worried is if you started to see people disengaging and just sort of saying mm. it's lost. Whereas in fact, what you're seeing is people more and more activated every day and reacting to the, 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 the problems that are, that are uh, almost inevitably accompanying the transition. Just one quick follow-up to that. Does, does our, what is it, $1.3 billion in military aid give us leverage on things like 
how women are treated, women's rights, or is it, or is it really you have to use the bully pulpit more? Well, I think we use all the tools um, in our disposal. I, mean, I think one of the amazing uh, features of, of the U.S. response to the Arab Spring, and, and you know, I've only been in the executive branch uh, for three years, so I don't have a, a vast well of uh, you know, uh, government sort of analogous tales to draw upon, but in the Arab Spring, the degree to which the, the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, the Justice Department, the Treasury Department, if they're going on economic missions, which is so important, everybody's singing from the same songbook. Um, and so, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, General Dempsey in his consultations, uh, you know, the, the role of women is, you know, very, very prominent in his engagement. And so the leverage that we have by virtue of that relationship, you know, is something that, um, you know, is accompanied by a, an attention to this set of issues. Same with the NGO issue which affects women and, and men alike, the, the, the crackdown on NGOs and the, and the suspicion particularly of the American NGOs who have run into trouble, but also Egyptian NGOs who get less attention. Again, you know, seeing uh, all of the tools in the relationship, all of the, the, the history, uh, you know, and the bonds that have been built up by virtue not only of the military assistance, but the training and, and you know, uh, again, the, the um, just the, the synergies that have existed over generations, those are, we, those are an advantage, you know, in our diplomacy. Those are, are tools, I think, that help us, you know, get a hearing in places we may not, not otherwise. Did you have one? No, I would just add, I think because of the, some of these long-term security relationships with a place like Egypt, for example, since the Camp David Accords, um, we have very, you know, strong military to military relationships, very O clear and open channels of communication at the highest level, but they also have an experience dealing with us as a democracy, and they understand that these issues, the treatment of women, the treatment of NGOs, are very important issues in our democracy. And, and so when issues like for, uh, foreign assistance requests, security assistance requests go to the Congress, these things do get connected. And I think the Egyptians in particular, who have a very long relationship with us and who have gone through many, many legislative mm -hmm. cycles to be beneficiaries of American mm -hmm. aid, really do understand this. And so we have the, the channels and they have the experience to understand that these things really are, um, are related to one another as we think about the relationship we're charting um, going forward. And I, I think that um, the leadership has been very receptive to some of the messages that have been sent recently, and they, and they are taking some steps to try to correct some of the, the missteps that have been taken. Like what, what is Like the, the treatment of the NGOs. Yeah. Um, let's turn the conversation, since we're, we have limited time, um, on, on the role of women. Foreign policy uh, recently said what we all know, that women are woefully un un underrepresented in uh, national security ranks uh, at the very highest level, which begs the question, um, why does it matter? I mean, obviously it matters to the women sitting in this room and their career paths, but why, do, why does it matter on outcomes? And I wanted to pose the question to both of you, are women, including women at the highest level decision-making on national security issues, whether here or elsewhere. Does that lead to a more peaceful society in your view? Do you, th do you really think women make a difference there? You go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, I'd say a couple things. First of all, you know, back to John Hamry's point, you know, you, you want to f fully avail yourself of the, the talent pool, if you will. And when women are underrepresented, you by definition are not accessing the full range of talent. Um, and so just from a uh, getting the best quality people, the highest standards of excellence, the best people who are able to contribute to policy, to contribute to problem solving and all that, you want to have women included in the pool as fully as men by definition. Um, you know, I think the question of outcomes um, you know, I think there's a lot of literature that suggests that the answer is that you do get a different outcome. What I'll just speak to from my experience, I think that there, you know, you can, it's, it's a, the way in which people approach their positions, approach leadership, approach problem solving, is very individually, it's very, in, you know, specific to the individual. But what I can say is in the Pentagon, for example, you know, as 
we've gone from, you know, when I first went there in 1993, we had, we invited, uh, had a lunch for all the senior women in the building and we were at one table. <laughs> and then for the next six weeks, it was like, what were they talking about? <laughs> <You know? laughs> the great conspiracy theory. Um, now, I mean, I would fill the, I would overflow out of the executive dining room in the Pentagon, which is a big, a big room. There are a lot of women leaders. That said, there are a lot of women leaders kind of coming up and at the middle ranks and there's still very few at the top. There's still ceilings to be broken. When I, we go into a leadership conference with the secretary and the chiefs and the service secretaries and the chairman and the COCOM, the combatant commands, um, more often than not, um, there's one woman at the table, maybe two. Um, it's myself and a colleague um, and out of this, this whole room. Um, that, that's, that's gonna change over time. Um, the thing I, that, that's been different is you've had a lot of women leadership at that middle level, um, for example, of our QDR. I was very proud, the first QD, set of uh, quadrennial defense review briefings. First person stood up to brief the strategy, it was a woman, Kathleen Hicks. Next person stood up to brief Homeland Defense, it was a woman, Christine Wormuth. Next person <coughs> stood up and, and so on. There were four or five women leaders in the QDR process that I actually do think affected how the process was run. It was more open, it was more collaborative, it was more inclusive just by style, um, by virtue of their leadership. Now, whether that's attributed to their gender or to these individuals, you know, I'm, I'm not a uh, uh, social scientist who can, you know, make a right. conclusive observation, but I, I think that there was definitely a different approach that was influenced by the leadership of this handful of key women. Which raises a personal question. Let's get personal with you. You're leaving. And one of the things that you cited was your three children. Mm -hmm. uh, how much is the work-life, work-family balance an issue for women getting and staying at the top? Well, um, I have a wonderful um, older mentor who once said to me, Michelle, you can have it all. You just can't always have it all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think, you know, these jobs, and Samantha can speak to this, are incredibly demanding, they're 24 seven, um, nonstop. I think for our family, um, the issue is that my husband's also serving. He's the Deputy Secretary of Veterans Affairs. So you have two parents of kids, nine, uh, 12, and 14, who were once six, nine, and 11 <laughs> when they started, you know, That's who the problem. basically, yeah. um, you know, had parents who were very, very committed and engaged in this, uh, supporting this president. Um, and at some point, just from a family perspective, um, something has to give. You know, the good news is what I've discovered over my career is that there are many seasons and many chapters. There are many ways to do public service. It doesn't all have to be in government. It can be in government, on, and I hope I'm not done in that respect. I hope I do have future opportunities to formally serve in government, but there are many ways to contribute and, and to serve in a, in a public service sort of way from outside government. And I'm fully committed to that path, and whether it's in a think tank or in mentoring programs or whatever, um, I'll be finding my way in the future to continue, to continue on that path in some way. Samantha, but with a little more time to see with my a little, I was gonna say, yeah. um, they're at a critical age. Samantha, I, want, I didn't forget you on that question. You didn't want to answer it first. Oh. Uh, women. <laughs> I don't want to answer any questions. <laughs> women, no. I've learned that. <laughs> Do you think women are, are um, our inclusion of women is more likely to lead to more peaceful outcomes. Uh, and, and as particularly somebody who's covered, you know, genocide and atrocities, and there are women in some of those decision-making roles. Um, what's your overall perspective on that? I, I'm very, uh, not coincidentally, very much with Michelle uh, in terms of just the individu individuated nature of the human condition and, and just believing. I mean, I remember as a kind of kid in my early 20s in Bosnia, one of the leaders of the Bosnian Serbs it was this woman, Biljana Plavšić, and she was this, and she was famous for kissing the warlord Archon on the cheeks, and everybody took her, sort of plucked her out of context. You see, you see, women leaders too perpetuate ethnic cleansing, you know, mm -hmm. as if it was itself sort of, uh, you know, a whopping case sample. I mean, I think Michelle's point, 
and John's point, right, which is we don't even begin to know. We don't have the case sampling. <laughs> I mean, we've got these isolated examples, and you know, for every Biljana Plavšić, you've got an Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and right. and you've got what the Nobel Committee did, you know, this year, sort of affirming the role uh, of women. Uh, so there's the intrinsic sort of good and necessity of people who represent half the population and you know who are just by virtue of being mothers and connected with education and health and so forth in different ways by virtue of taking care of their uh, their, their families and so forth you know often in the home I mean that that is a special sort of set of insights but I think it's going to take us some time of really integrating women into these leadership roles to have a kind of empirical base from which we can can draw you know uh, conclusions I will say that um, you know, I, I worked uh, on my own, I mean, much more in a, a, a line of work like yours, you know, writing and kind of doing, and there are all kinds of issues. People ask about women in journalism and women in academia, and there are versions of this conversation that occur uh, everywhere. It is different being in a, in a large institution. I mean, there, you know, the, the impact of having Michelle, you know, at the table, at the deputies, you know, for women like me, you know, is, is very profound and very inspirational in the same way that for all of us, it's incredibly inspirational to see Secretary Clinton and Ambassador Rice and <laughs> Secretary Napolitano, you know, duking it out at, 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 at principal's meetings with one another and with, you know, and I mean, it's the nature of the, the deliberative uh, process. It's no, there's, you know, the, 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 I can't even think of an issue that's had a gender alignment, mm -hmm. um, uh, at least that I've seen. Um, so I don't think you can draw easy, easy correlations in terms of where people would end up. Um, but, you know, again, for all of the challenges that, that Michelle has described, which I think we're chipping away at, and, and again, mentoring begets mentoring, hopefully, um, you know, some of the societies, uh, you know, that we're talking about, whether in the Arab Spring or, you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, conflict-ridden societies, I mean, we're not just talking about the challenges that we face here uh, with a pool of incredibly educated, capable women, and, you know, are they hitting glass ceilings or do they have to leave the workforce? take care of families, are they welcome when they come back? We're talking about utter exclusion, um, right. you know, and so there what we know empirically and uh, just as a matter of, uh, you know, common sense uh, is that, you know, we can achieve, you know, dramatic improvements with, uh, you know, just, uh, just uh, you know, added uh, weight, the, the weight of U.S. diplomacy, the weight of U.S. leadership, uh, but also just a few individuals in those societies, which is where the leadership ultimately has to come from, uh, can make such a profound difference in a short period of time. I mean, the difference that the Yemeni Nobel Prize winner has made to women, mm -hmm. you know, to bringing women on the sh out, you know, to the streets, I think is profound, and it's having a ripple effect across the Arab world. So telling those stories and highlighting those leadership profiles, I think, is critical. Yeah, because I, it just uh, there's a, a question here about uh, to what extent do um, do people in the U.S. government actually know about the National Action Plan, and um, certainly people in the public don't know about it, but. I, I think, and so I was going to have you address that, but I, the same way that Secretary Clinton has made, a, tr I think, a terrific economic argument about integrating women into economies, mm -hmm. you actually have studies out now that say if you integrate women in, it actually adds to your GDP. Mm -hmm. So she can go around and say to foreign leaders, if you include women, it, you, there's a self-interest in it. Yeah. So how do you make the self-interested case um, around the world for this? A and B. How do you um, how d do you get people talking about this and not just like putting it on the shelf and you know moving on? Yeah. Well, we f folded into the plan, and Rob Bershinsky is here, who uh, is a detail. Michelle was kind enough to loan him to the NSC. He's our woman in chief, Rob, uh, <laughs> uh, in in coordinating uh, these amazing people across the government's uh, efforts with regard to the the National Action Plan, but. Rob and I would have, you know, these tortured exchanges, you know, he'd, I'd, I'd get this research that he'd, you know, I'd say, well, where's the data? I mean, basically right. looking to be able to make the pragmatic case, not only externally, but also within our own government, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be able to, if there's any non-convert out there, you want to be able to sway them. And, um, and I'd get, you know, Rob would send me what to my, you know, former academic eyes looked a little more like anecdote than, you know, empirical work, not Rob's fault. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, it just, it isn't, it, we, we, we have some of what we need, and what we did was we put all of what we, the sort of greatest hits of the empirical work are in the plan. 
as a complement to the actions that the different agencies are taking. But I mentioned earlier that Georgetown has uh, you know, created the center, uh, which I think they hope to make a hub for this kind of uh, work going forward. And you know, the funding from foundations has to follow. You know, this, is, this is the long game. Because over time, you know, I think what I described as axioms in this country and in our policy process and in this administration, I think they are axioms at the, high, you know, at the leadership levels for sure. Um, but they're not axioms in the world. And mm -hmm. I think you need the data, but you also need to not walk away from just the intrinsic point that John and Michelle made, which is just, even if you didn't have data, even if it didn't correlate, <laughs> they don't get to be excluded. Um, right. So you start there, and then, uh, and then again, I think we've got good anecdote, and we're building toward you know, good empirical work. Michelle, how would you make the case? You know, I, again, I think, um, Right now, we are going on anecdote and experience, and particularly in places, you know, first in Iraq, then in Afghanistan, um, in places like Libya, where we see the difference in terms of particularly societies, um, you know, emerging from conflict. You you see the difference that the participation makes, and you may not be able to document it and prove that it's statistically relevant, but um, folks on the ground see the difference and so they follow it as a best practice. But I, I agree with Samantha that part of what we have to do is build the body of, of work to actually demonstrate that this is the case, that it's not just... We have a question here and maybe you could uh, um, address this just looking around at the women you've hired and so on. What are the examples of skills or traits unique to women that facilitate success in this field? Unique to women. You know, I... Um, Again, it's hard to generalize, but um, one of the uh, books I read in college that I still remember <laughs> is about, uh, was written by Carol Gilligan, who's a mm -hmm. famous uh, psychologist who researched the development uh, processes of young girls and young boys. Mm -hmm. And her thesis, which I think a lot of research has borne out, is that boys tend to develop by placing themselves in a, this is very oversimplified, so for those of you who are professionals in this field, <laughs> really forgive me. But the general, the layman's sort of interpretation is that, um, uh, you know, boys develop and the name of the game is sort of placing themselves in a hierarchy. Whereas for girls, the name of the game becomes developing and placing yourself in a network. And as much as that may be stereotypical or oversimplified, there is a kernel of truth in there that I do think um, the women leaders that I see operating the Pentagon, more often than not, have an instinctive leadership style towards networking and collaboration. And they're extremely, they tend to be very good. Not, again, not every individual, but they are, uh, um, uh, more often than not, very good at the collaborative stakeholder, getting participation, buy-in, um, uh, drawing people into a process to feel ownership and so forth. I mean, the latest example that I just watched was uh, the development of this new defense strategy where you have, I think, unprecedented amount of buy-in from the senior leadership because of the very collaborative leadership style mm of uh, the people who led it, um, two of whom happened to be senior women. Um, doesn't mean that it couldn't be, you couldn't get the same result with some, you know, wonderful, talented male leaders as well. But I do, I do tend to see that as a, an approach that more often than not, the best of the female leaders in the Pentagon have. Do you have advice for women in this room? You've been in a very male-dominated part of the mm -hmm. male-dominated national mm -hmm. security um, structure. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for the women, young women in this room on how to operate in that environment? I guess um, I would say don't mind it. Mm. Be yourself. If someone asks you the really well-intentioned but dumb question, like how did a nice girl end like you end up <laughs> just, just sort of shrug and say, gosh, you know, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, smile and give a funny answer, but um, just sort of d don't, don't mind it and um, do your best and show your, uh, be excellent at what you do. And um, more often than not, that will 
turn to your advantage to say, you, you know, and, and, you know, wow, you know, that, the, the, you know, that person is really exceptional. They may end up noticing you more because you do stand out as the only woman in the room. But the name of the game is to not let the otherness of the environment, which will sometimes strike you like, here I am again as the only woman in the <laughs> yeah. room, um, just to not, to not mind it and to, um, to just focus on the quality of your contribution and the quality of your work. And that will speak for itself, and that will create opportunities on its own. And Samantha, you have a slightly different experience as somebody who rose to prominence outside the government structures. What, what's been your experience um, going inside? And any, again, any advice to young women in this room? Um, well, I definitely agree with Michelle that I think that the more self-conscious one is about numbers or you know, any, even like having a chip of some kind or fearing the worst or it did, that wouldn't help very much. Um, I think it just would kind of raise the overall level of anxiety. I think what helps, and this I'd say to women and young women and men alike, is, is just knowing something about something. I mean, I think that the, the people who thrive um, in government are people who master their domain. They don't have to master every domain, but what you're there, gover I, I happen to love baseball, um, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm struck, and it, again, government is still quite, quite fresh to me, and so I still have these epiphanies where I'm like, oh. But just the degree to which to get anything done in government, it's not, you know, occasionally there's, there's but very, very rarely, there's a home run that can be hit where the run gets scored simply by somebody doing something fantastic. Like that would be perhaps like a peace negotiator scoring a you know uh, a peace deal, bringing an end to a conflict or something. It's exceedingly rare. Much more often, you know, it turns on you know one person hitting a single and the next person moving the runner over and the next person. You know, it's it's it requires. I mean, it's it's not just that collaboration makes for bre better product without collaboration and that kind of teamwork and that spirit, but everybody having a very precise domain and skill and chop, as they say in government, um, you know, th there is no product or there is no output in the world. And I, and I think, again, for men and women alike, I think a focus, this is hard in government, but a, but a, a focus uh, on output on impact in the world as against inputs. You know, sometimes we, we at the end of the year, we, we go over what we've, in my tiny little office, smaller than Michelle's domain, but we go over what we've done for the year, and, you know, I, I, there is a distinction between what we've done or gotten the government to do, which is really important and arguably a precondition to, to potential outcomes, but the real measure of, of the work that we do in public service is the, is the difference that, that is made in the world. And I think keeping an eye on that is, is very challenging. And I guess the last thing I'd say um, is just on the work-family balance. I, I had a baby uh, when I got to uh, the White House, um, not that minute, but <laughs> 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 my water broke in a very heated discussion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on an issue that, she'll go, that she'll go nameless. No, it didn't. The problem is I didn't know anything about, like, I, I had watched the movies, and so I thought it was going to gush. But it turns out, like, water breaking comes in many See, different forms. See, water really did break. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, in a very well, heated... A, I thought you were just... In, in, in a heated a, policy, in a discussion, policy with discussion with a very prominent wow. uh, member of the administration. Um, <laughs> But he didn't know, and I didn't know, so we were no worse for wear. Uh, but I kept working, of course, and I was like, God, it's not that hot in here. Like, why am I sweating? Like, what's Anyway, this is, story, Rob, so Rob, Rob will tell me uh, too much information as we, where is Rob? Anyway, so, but to say that uh, that's an example of the, and so what I, you know, when you go, you're supposed to go quickly after your water break, but I was like, you know, working and typing and. Um, How far away were you from your due date? I were was like two, over it, two and a half weeks so, or early. Early, okay. yeah. And so, and I think do? it was the tension of the discussion that precipitated <laughs> the birth of my child. 
Anyway, who's no worse for wear, it turns out. But, but, uh, but when I got to the hospital, they're like, you should have come right when your water broke. And, and um, I said, well, but I didn't know exactly how water breaks, because it had never broken before. <laughs> Uh, and um, anyway, and was of course you know in the hospital on my BlackBerry finishing everything up and all the ways. That, <laughs> and then when I went back to work, having taken uh, a leave, um, you know the 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 breastfeeding BlackBerry. You know you can even do dual <laughs> BlackBerry. I mean it's it's uh, there's an awful lot you can do in the way of multitasking. But is there a, pump, is there a pumping station? There's all the, kinds um, of in, pumping in the. In the uh, <laughs> there are many in, in the, the White House. House. Well, yeah. it, it, and that's the other thing about the Women's Network is the number of horrifying, he walked in on me while I was pumping stories. <laughs> that I heard upon coming back, you know, meant that I was like literally like in a safe, you know, a top secret safe, so nobody, but, uh, but anyway, so there are these challenges, um, but the challenges, and this is where I have such, uh, uh, you know, both respect for Michelle for the sacrifices she made in, in being in the government for the ages of the children that she describes, the sacrifices only get greater as your, as your kid grows up, you know, and so now I have this, unbelievable nearly three-year-olds, um, you know, who I, I just can't bear to part with, you know, in the morning and, and, you know, run home at night to, to see. And that, so I think it only gets more and more pronounced. So thinking about the timing of how to go in and out. And, and it's not as if non-governmental life for people who work as hard as I'm sure everyone in this room and who are as committed to what they do is, you know, is somehow a cakewalk uh, in terms of the work-life balance. Um, but there is something about government now having tasted a lot of different careers that is unrelenting. There's something unrelenting and, and I know I feel, you know, when I wake up in the middle of the night and I see the red light on the Blackberry and I just, you know, I just feel like it's, it's going to be bad <laughs> and it's going to be my problem. It's not going to be anybody, you know, whereas as a columnist or something I could make it Michelle's problem, right. Right? you know, which was much more fun. <laughs> Uh, and write on your own time and so forth. So, so I just, you know, I think it's, it, it, you can't, you, you can have it all and you have to have it at different times and I think, but you know, child rearing is not a monolith, you know, uh, work is not a monolith, you know, there, 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 there are different ways to think about how to sequence and how to, how to stagger things, but, but you definitely, there is no, we're all kind of all in people and, and it's, it's hard, you know, to feel as if um, you can't be all in in one direction or the other. So something has to give. Is, something it, is gives. it totally unrealistic though for the White House or, you know, upper echelons of state or defense to, uh, to afford more flexibility in, in that, you know, you end up, I, you know, I, my work day I find is just so merged with my life I, as a mother yeah. as well. I mean, I, I don't, you just, but it doesn't mean you're in the office from boom to boom, but I don't know that that is ever a realistic yeah. possibility. I for think you guys. it's very difficult in the White House, given the demands of you know the um, supporting the president and so forth. But I think in the agencies, you know, it really depends on the culture that's set in the organization. Um, when I um, had my first child um, and came back and remarkably got promoted uh, immediately after maternity leave was the undersecretary at the time, Walt Slocum, bent over backwards to make a make it make a, a more flexible approach work for someone who is a deputy assistant secretary and dual headed as a, a principal deputy, um, and that was because of his enlightened leadership. And you know we made it we made it work for a while because he knew that making that work was critical to to keeping me. Um, one of the things I've done following in his footsteps is really put an emphasis on within the the parameters that Samantha described, which is an un, you know, very big jobs for a lot of people, trying to create more flexibility. So, for example, um, we've put a big push on alternative work schedule in my organization, and almost every office has adopted it, so mm -hmm. that there is cross coverage of portfolios, and you know, when there is a lull, people feel like they can take some time, ha get you know a little bit of recharging their batteries with their family, come and there's somebody's there to cover them and so forth. It's a work in progress, but it's amazing not only the difference it makes in morale, but it, when you invest in your people and their sort of quality of experience at work, you actually get huge jumps in perform performance. Mm -hmm. And all of the biz business literature says that. So, it's it's a real it's worth making the investment. It takes management, 
you know, relentless management attention to try to make it work. But guess what? It's not just about making it more workable for the women. It, it's making it work more um, workable for, yeah. for, for everyone. And the number of young men who've, uh, who are now taking paternity leave in the organization has gone way up. I mean, so it is, um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's got to be a leadership focused a focus and it's got to be backed up at the highest levels and one of the things I've had the blessing to have is two now two secretaries in a row that have been very supportive of this agenda and trying to make a very demanding workplace a little bit more uh, family friendly. I've watched President George H.W. Bush, President Clinton, President W. Bush and this president come in saying we're going to be different we're going to be family friendly and watching everybody I know just kind of disappear into the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> Their families wonder where they went. I mean, is there any alternative? I, don't know. I mean, it's, I think there are a couple things, or the, the, maybe three things. One, Michelle has just described what's called, it's an old fashioned word, leadership. You know, actually putting in place, using the position that she has, you know, as it, such an influential position in the administration to institute a set of practices that are going to, you know, ease the 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 burdens and the and the and the acute trade-offs that I think people feel and that's incredibly important. I think there's a, a second dimension which is psychological and it's just liberating ourselves. I could leave the office in the day, you know, and um, I mean meetings permitting. Um, uh, but I don't. You think, people, you think people are going to be looking at you? No, when you're I don't even know if it's that. I mean, I think it's uh, whether it's, uh, you know, I don't, some sense of what good girls do or what sense of what people, I, it's not so much about how other people would look at me. It's my own uh, sort of, I guess, attachment to the work, sense of responsibility, sense of ethic. It's an old fashioned ethic. And I don't, and it's an anachronistic ethic, perhaps. But I think you could have even as the kinds of leadership that, that Michelle has described, and there still has to be, women themselves have to liberate themselves and just do what they need to do in order to balance. Um, but the third dimension is, you know, let's not kid ourselves about what, what balance can look like. I mean, there have been a case, like during the Arab Spring, we were all, I don't even know Living. if we ever, we lived <laughs> in the Situation Room and, and um, uh, that was, you know, just very hard to be away from your, your kids. Mm -hmm. for the, it just kept going and then, you know, it was great. It was one country after the other, but, you know, you'd think that a country would had sort of subside and then the next thing you knew. And, and I had won uh, the height of the Libya crisis. It wasn't a, uh, a deputies level uh, meeting, but it was a, a meeting that was setting up the deputies, a very important meeting. And I attempted to do the phone call from home with my then two-year-old. You know, and the entire call, as I remember it anyway, was, Mommy, stop talking. Mommy, stop talking. <laughs> Mommy, not Obama time. Declan time. <laughs> not Obama time. Declan time. Over and over again. And, um, and I just couldn't, and here I was, you know, trying, you know, again, it was a mess. And, uh, and he was right. I was home, so it wasn't Obama time. Right. It was Declan time, right. and there isn't much enough Declan time. And so he had a point. So, so we could free ourselves, you know, psychologically. We could have great leadership, and there's still just the, the fact that you know you you got to be with who you're with. You got to be right. with your 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 work and your and your commitments and and or your family and your commitments. So. Well, has also been somebody who's like been familiar with putting the mute button on for the three-year-old. <laughs> I, I, I was leading the call. I was leading the call. That was the call, challenge. A <laughs> um, but I just wanted to thank you both, both, both for sharing some insights on policy, but sharing your lives with this audience. Um, it's really appreciated. I think you've been a great source of inspiration. Thank okay. you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, um, Michelle, Samantha, Nina. We really appreciate you giving your time and your perspectives and your experiences this evening. And this is, I think, really the unique space that WISE occupies, um, is, is really allowing for this kind of discussion that merges. Obviously, we want to shine a spotlight on all the wonderful female expertise we have um, on international security, but at the same time, provide this 
forum for talking about many issues that our younger women and our women coming up the ranks actually are asking about and wondering and often are struggling with and feeling isolated about. So I really appreciate uh, your candor and, and your participation. We are, we have a lovely reception for those of you who are able to stay um, and we would love to uh, continue the discussion and of course visit with all of you that we haven't seen in so long. So thank you very much and we hope to host many future events and discussions here at CSIS. Thanks. Thank you.